do today is I want to start and finish the stuff we were doing with differentiating identities. How many of you have seen the Gaussian distribution before outside of this class? Any other names for the Gaussian distribution? Normal. Any other names? One other name you probably should have heard of. The bell curve. The, bell curve. You know, the more names something has, as a rule of thumb, the more important it is. All right. This is something that has three different names. The normal distribution is quite important. How many of you have seen the determination of the normalization constant of the Gaussian? All right. I saw this trick uh, my first year in college. To me, it's one of the most enjoyable ways to evaluate an integral I've ever seen. And if you've never seen it before, this is fun. So Gaussian. So it's 1 over the square root of 2 pi sigma squared e to the negative x minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared. And it turns out that if you integrate this from minus infinity to infinity, you get 1. And if you have you know, a professor who can draw well, it looks something like that. OK? If you have a professor who can draw better, it looks more like a bell curve. We will assume that mu equals 0, because when we're trying to integrate, it's not so bad. You can also change variables and assume sigma equals 1. So standard change of variables without loss of generality, mu equals 0, sigma equals 1. If you can handle that case, by changing variables, you can handle the general case. So we just need to prove that in that case, it integrates to 1. Translation is not going to be difficult to handle. And then this is just sending x to x over sigma. And then the dx will go to dx over sigma. Well, the square root of sigma squared is sigma. You can hopefully see the change of variables happening. So let's let i for integral be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. The goal is to show that this integrates to 1, or to pi, or to something nice, to find what the value of this integral is. What techniques might you try to do this integral? Symmetry. Symmetry. So you could reduce it to doubling the integral from 0 to infinity. We don't have an antiderivative, unfortunately. In terms of doing integration by parts, it's not really a product of two things. I could maybe try 1 times this, maybe try to integrate by parts and start having x's coming into play. There's no really nice way to attack this. Let's square the integral. Minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus x squared over 2 dx. Is it OK for me to use the symbol x again? I've integrated out x. I can integrate it out over here. But let's use a different symbol. Any thoughts what would be a good symbol to use? Why? So now I have a double integral. Minus infinity to infinity, integral minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus x squared plus y squared over 2 dx dy. This is a strange, strange thing to do. You start with a one-dimensional integral, and you make it a two-dimensional integral. Normally, this is a bad idea. This actually is a great idea here. It saves the day. If you haven't seen it before, this is absolutely amazing. I can't tell you the name right now, because if I tell you the name of this method, it will tell you exactly what you should do in the next step. Any thoughts what we should do? only if you haven't seen this before. Yes? Replace x squared plus y squared with r squared. Excellent. There are two things you can do in Calc 3. You can switch the order of integrations, and you can change variables. This function is symmetric in x and y. Switching the order of integration is not going to gain us anything. Right? So switching doesn't help. No help as symmetric. So we change variables. And this is called the polar trick. 
And so we let x equal r cosine theta, y equals r sine theta, dx dy becomes r dr d theta. And when we do all of this, now we have the bounds of integration. r goes from 0 to infinity, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. And what we get is when we do this, we get i squared is the integral r goes from 0 to infinity, the integral Actually, I guess I should do it the other way. Uh, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. r goes from 0 to infinity. e to the minus r squared over 2 r dr d theta. The r integral is actually really nice. What's the derivative of e to the negative r squared over 2? Well, we want to do like a u substitution. We have e to the minus u. The derivative of u, oh, the 2's are going to cancel perfectly. So if you want, you could do u substitution with u is equal to r squared over 2 du is r dr. And if you do that, we get the integral theta goes from 0 to 2 pi d theta integral u goes from 0 to infinity e to the minus u du. And I can split the integration up like this because there's no theta dependence. OK. Yes. And so what's the theta integral equal to? 2 pi. I'm integrating the function 1 from 0 to 2 pi. I get 2 pi. That's not so bad. And now the integral of u, I get e to the minus u evaluated at 0 and infinity with a negative sign, flips it over. When, you do, when the dust settles, you get 1. So we have i squared is equal to 2 pi. Therefore, the integral we care about is is it plus the square root of 2 pi, or is it minus the square root of 2 pi? Which is it? We're integrating a non-negative function, right? It's got to be the positive sign. So again, when we squared things in the beginning, we introduced this indeterminacy. It could be positive, it could be negative. But you know, fortunately, we can notice what's going on here, and we can see that it's going to be a positive. So now we have the value of the Gaussian integral. It's the square root of 2 pi. That's the normalization constant we need. So this is a phenomenal trick. Now that we have this, we can now go through and we can now start calculating moments. All right. Any questions before I start erasing and start doing moments? Yes? Why, why did you drop off the 1 over square root of 2 pi at the beginning? Well, because how do we know that there's a 1 over square root of 2 pi there? We know because we've done the calculation, and at the end of the day, we get it equals square root of 2 pi. So the whole point of this is to justify that this is the normalization constant. The sigma squared inside the square root is just coming from a change of variables. You know, replace x over sigma with x. The mu is just going to translate everything down. It's not going to affect things. The difficult thing is the square root of 2 pi. How many of you have seen the gamma function by chance? So if you've seen the gamma function, by doing another change of variables, you can actually reduce this to the special value of a gamma function. I believe. It's gamma of a half. And so what this tells you is that, uh, oh no, I think it's twice gamma of a half. It's twice gamma of a half. So I'm not going to go into that, but if you've seen the gamma function, play with that. You can prove something along those lines. All right, let's start calculating moments. And just for simplicity, we'll assume mu equals 0. So moments of Gaussian. So we want to integrate from minus infinity to infinity of x to the k, 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma squared e to the negative x squared over 2 sigma squared dx. And k is going to be a different integer. Which integers are trivial to do? Zero. zero. We just did zero. One. Why is 1 trivial? You do get a nice u substitution, but that's looking at it at too high of a level. Sigma's one, sigma's very. Well, well sigma's not one now. We're doing now the general case. So but but why, why? Why? Okay, so when k equals one, it's the mean. Why is this easy to do? It's, it's symmetric. It's symmetric. 
But this is an odd function. If you integrate an odd function over a symmetric region, what do you get? You get zero. You definitely need to know this for a lot of math competitions. This is one of the key facts they do, is they give you this horrible looking integral. But the integral turns out to be zero. And so it's not a real big deal. Because they're not asking you to find the antiderivative, they're asking you to calculate a definite integral. So if k is odd, easy. Zero by symmetry. So the only ones that are really worth looking at is when k is an even number. So the first interesting case to look at would be k equals 2. And again, if you wanted to, you could assume sigma equals 1. We can always change variables and figure out the sigma dependence. That's not so bad. When we look at this, anybody have any thoughts as to how to handle this? How can we do this integral? What could we try? Yeah. OK, so if we integrate by parts, we have to choose a u, and we have to choose a dv. OK, so we try u equals x squared, and then du is going to make it smaller, 2x dx. Good. Making things smaller, I like this. dv, I'll, I'll screw the normalization constant, e to the negative x squared over 2 uh, dx. Uh-oh. This is a G-rated YouTube clip, so I can't say anything, but what am I thinking? Not good, right? I now need the antiderivative of e to the negative x squared over 2. We don't have an antiderivative. All right, well, maybe u is not x squared. Maybe u is e to the negative x squared over 2. And so now when we take the derivative of this, we get a negative... Um, 2x over 2, so we get negative x e to the negative x squared over 2. dv is going to be x squared dx. And now what will v be? x cubed over 3, right? And so now when you do your integration by parts, great! We had trouble integrating x squared times the Gaussian density. We're going to replace it with integrating x to the fourth times the density. We're going in the wrong direction. Although I think your hand was up first. Why can't it be x Why can't it be what? Well, that, that's the next thing to try. Is the difficulty is we want to break up the x squared. And if you think about it, and this is one of the reasons why I want to discuss this in great detail, this function is screaming at you that it wants something. When you look at e to the negative x squared over 2 sigma squared, when you look at e to the negative x squared, it wants something. What does it want? It doesn't want to be linked with dx. It wants to be linked with x dx. So if you want to do this by parts, what you really want to do is you want to split up the x. And you have e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma squared x dx. And you know, if I, I'll drop the sigma squared just to make things nice as I write, and now I'll get e to the minus x squared, I think, with a negative sign over 2. And now over here, du u would be x, du would just be dx. And now we've decreased the polynomial from x squared to 1. Everything will work. You can keep doing this in the general case. Everything will work. Okay. So you can handle this by integration by parts, but it's going to become more and more unpleasant. You have to see the right way to split things. But it's doable. OK. I want to show you how you can do this with differentiating identities, and then this will finish off the differentiating identities uh, unit of the course. But again, this is an extremely powerful technique. It can be used to handle a lot of problems. And the idea is identities are difficult to get. Once you get an identity, you want to milk it for all you can. So we know 1 is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over the square root of 2 pi sigma squared e to the negative x squared over 2 sigma squared dx. What's fascinating about this is, let's say you only care about the standard normal. How many of you have ever looked at you know, normal values in a table? 
So they only give you the values for the standard normal. And the reason is you can always do a change of variable to convert from anything else. How many of you have ever used log tables? So when I was in school, they taught us to handle log tables. It was a very useful skill. Uh, I'm hoping that that's far enough away that my teachers can't see my eyes. Why do you only have one table of logarithms? Why do you only have base e or base 10? Why do you only have one table for logarithms? There's a change of base formula. So the log of x base b is the log of x base c over the log of b base c. So if you know logarithms in base c, you know them in base b. You only need one table. It's very similar to the normal distribution. If you know the values of the normal distribution, if you know those probabilities, you know all probabilities. Again, one of the purposes of this class is to do mathematics that's a springboard to things you care about. The change of base formula is extremely important. People used to spend their entire lives calculating values of special functions. Other people spent their lives checking the calculations of people who spent their lives calculating special values of functions. There would be people who would calculate pi to 600, 700, 800 digits looking for patterns, and the people who would check their calculations. The whole purpose of this is you only need to do one calculation. That's phenomenal. You have one base, and you get every base from that. Did we do the Babylonian mathematics with how you multiply numbers and base 60? We didn't talk about base? Okay. All right. I'm going to do a small digression here before we get back to this as to why we care about all this. So the Babylonians were base 60. All right. How many people know their multiplication through their 10 by 10s? If this is not, you know, who's awake right now, you have issues. You cannot be a math major and not know your multiplication through 10 by 10s. Your 11s tables. Now, come on. I mean, 11s is not that bad, right? 12s. Shaking on my 12s. 13s. 17s. Okay. Imagine you're a Babylonian, young Babylonian scholar, and you need to now know multiplication. The Babylonians use base 60. How many things do you have to memorize? How many things do you have to memorize? 60 times 60. So 3,600 multiplications to know. Fortunately, it's not that bad. x times y is y times x, so you can almost cut it in half. So really, you can do it as 60 choose 2, which is about 1,800. It's a little bit more than that, but approximately 1,800. Because you know, we, we need to know all the squares. So it's actually 60, and then it's going to be um, 60 times 2. Choose two distinct numbers. Okay. And then you have to add a little bit to it. So it's going to be around 1,800. All right. Do the Babylonians have paper and pen? No, they had heavy stone tablets. You don't want to be carrying around a lot of heavy stone tablets. So you either have to memorize things, or you have to carry lookup tables. So do you know how the Babylonians multiplied? So x times y is x plus y squared minus x squared minus y squared over 2. It's a shame the camera can't capture the expressions on several of you. This does not seem like a good idea. You want to multiply x times y? Great. Instead of doing one multiplication, let's do three multiplications, two subtractions, a division, and a partridge and a pit. This seems absurd. Why is this a good idea? You only have to memorize the squares or have a lookup table for squares. You have to be able to subtract. Subtraction is a lot easier. And you have to be able to divide by 2. Division by 2 is not so bad. So this whole thing is leading to the subject of a lookup table. 
And it's all related to what we're doing. The Babylonians, rather than having a lookup table for all multiplications, they were efficient. They had a lookup table for squares. And they used their lookup table for squares to get things in general. What are we doing with logarithms? We only need logarithms in one base. If we have them in one base with the change of variable formula, we can get them in any base. Gaussian, what do we do with probabilities under the normal distribution? If we can do it for the standard normal, we can change and get it in anything else. So the idea is you do one calculation, and then you see how similar things just follow immediately from that. This is extremely important on you know, devices like this. My cell phone is very impressive. It's probably better than what we had in the Voyager space program. It's not as good as my laptop, which is not as good as some of the high-powered computers. The less power you have, the more you want to be able to look things up to do calculations quickly. You want to do interpolations. All right. So this gives us an idea of why we might care about doing these integrals, why we might want these moments, why we might want to calculate these probabilities. I want to talk about how you would do the moments of the Gaussians without doing integration by parts. And so we're going to go back and we're going to have 1 is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity of 1 over 2 pi sigma squared e to the negative x squared over 2 sigma squared. Uh, at the end of the day, all we're going to care about is the standard normal. What's interesting is even though we only care about the standard normal, we have to consider the general normal. And then we specialize at the end of the day to sigma equals 1. So this seems a little surprising. If you only care about the standard normal, it's not enough to study it in isolation. You have to study the whole family of distributions. And in some sense, if you think about the name of this method, differentiating identities, differentiating under the integral sign, if you don't have a parameter that moves, you can't do calculus. That's why this works. It's allowing us to exploit calculus. Well, we move the sigma squared over. 1 over square root of sigma squared is 1 over sigma. We move it over, and we get sigma equals the integral from minus infinity to infinity, 1 over square root of 2 pi, e to the negative x squared over 2 sigma squared dx. I could have kept the sigma where it was, I just like to move it like this. Now we apply an operator, we, apply, we differentiate with respect to sigma. And then we'll figure out in a moment you know, what's going on here, well, let's see. We have a negative x squared over 2 sigma squared. When we take the derivative of this with respect to sigma, we get a negative x squared with a negative 2 the negative 2 cancels the negative sign, the 2 cancels the 2, and we'll have over sigma cubed. We want to have a 1 over sigma here, so it turns out I want to apply the operator sigma squared d by d sigma. What do I get when I apply sigma squared d by d sigma? I take the derivative of sigma, I get 1, I multiply by sigma squared, I get sigma squared, equals the integral from minus infinity to infinity, 1 over square root of 2 pi, and now we get x squared over sigma e to the negative x squared over 2 sigma squared dx. That's exactly the integration we want. We can move the sigma inside the square root and it becomes the sigma squared. We now have x squared times the Gaussian's density. If you then want to know what happens when sigma equals 1, just take sigma equals 1. So this gives us the second moment. What would we do if we wanted to get the fourth moment? I'm sorry? No, if I did sigma to the fourth, that would just give me a higher power of sigma over here. It would still give me only an x squared. I want to get an x to the fourth. How can I get an x to the fourth? Take the derivative again. I'm going to just move the sigma over before I take the derivative. If I move the sigma over before I take the derivative, then I don't have to use the product rule here. So I'm going to have sigma cubed equals blah, and I'll apply sigma squared d by d sigma. What do I get when I apply sigma squared d by d sigma to sigma cubed? What do we get? I get what? So I get 3 sigma to the 4th is the integral minus infinity to infinity, 
1 over square root of 2 pi, I'll now have x to the fourth over sigma e to the negative x squared over 2 sigma squared dx. I have two data points, sigma squared, 3 sigma to the fourth. What do you think the power of the x to the sixth term is going to be? The, the power of sigma. It should be sigma to what power? If I have x to the sixth, it should be six. So if you look at what's going on here, if I put in an x to the sixth, I want to change variables. I want x over sigma. When you think about what's going on, if I then do the eighth moment, I should be getting a sigma to the eighth. So if you think in terms of units, things are right. You know, the sigma down below here cancels this x over here. x and sigma have to be in the same units. Make them both meters in your mind. So if x and sigma are both meters, this is unitless, this is unitless. If I now put in an x to the fourth, I now have units of meters to the fourth. My final answer has to have units of meters to the fourth. It's got to look like sigma to the fourth. If I put in sigma to the twelfth, my units have to be meters to the twelfth. It's got to be sigma to the twelfth. We know the sigma dependence. Without even doing any calculation, just by doing a unit analysis, we know the units. The difficulty is we don't know the coefficient. So we know when we have x squared, it's 1 times sigma squared. When we have 4, it's 3 times sigma to the fourth. What's the relation between 2 and 1 and 4 and 3? So I have 2, 1, 4, 3, 6, 5. It's natural to think it's going to be 5. Unfortunately, two data points is not enough to determine a complicated relation. We have to do it again. So we multiply through by sigma, and we would have 3 sigma to the fifth, and then we apply the operator sigma squared d by d sigma squared. Oh, we're going to get 3 times, we're going to get 5 times 3 sigma to the sixth. And so if we just record what we get, second moment was I'm going to write it as 1 sigma squared. The fourth moment, I'm going to write it as 3 times 1 sigma to the fourth. The sixth moment, 5 times 3 times 1 sigma to the sixth. And hopefully now you can see what should we use? Induction, right? We haven't used induction all day, right? That's too long to go without doing something by induction. You could try to do the integration by parts by induction as well. It's going to be a very similar argument. And you could make the integration by parts by induction work as well. If we have something of this form, we move a sigma over, oh, the 6 is going to become a 7, we pull down a 7, and you can see the pattern coming. So it turns out we define m double factorial to be m times m minus 2 dot 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 times either 2 or 1 depending on the parity. So we basically keep taking every other until we get all the way down to 2 or 1. It is not the factorial of the factorial. And the question is, why do we define the double factorial like this? Because this is the expression that occurs more frequently in mathematics. We typically do not have factorials of factorials. This is a good thing, right? The factorial is large. If you have something that's the factorial of a factorial, it's astronomically large. The double factorial is actually smaller than the factorial. So the 2mth moment of the Gaussian turns out to be 2m double factorial. It's 2m, 2m minus 2, 4 times 2. Turns out there's a nice way to write this. What do you notice about all of these numbers? They're even. So I can pull out m copies of 2 and I'm left with m factorial. So if you take the double factorial of an even number, there's actually a combinatorial interpretation of this. This is the number of ways to pair 2m objects into m pairs of 2. And in a lot of things in mathematics, the fact that there's a combinatorial interpretation of this is extremely useful. And it turns out you can write this as 2m choose 2, 2m 
minus 2, choose 2, 4, choose 2, 2, choose 2. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to prove that these are the same. And so this is pairing things. I have two m objects. I choose two of them, and that's a pair. I then have two minus two objects. I choose two of them. That's a pair. The question is, is this right, or did I make a mistake? And so when you look at this, I think there's a small danger that I might have introduced order, that I have what's my first pair, what's my second pair, what's my third pair. And so when you're doing something like this, you have to be very careful. And you have to, I think, to make this work, because when I match things in pairs, I don't care who's the first pair, who's the second pair, who's the third pair. So as an exercise, I'll let you think about the combinatorics so of that. If you like combinatorics, this is a good thing to think about. This becomes another nice way of just reviewing proofs by induction, and then we'll shift to um, the Rochester problems. So claim 2m minus 2, okay, 2m double factorial ways to match 2m objects in pairs. So let's just prove this rigorously by induction. We haven't done a rigorous, you know, full, gory, detailed proof by induction in a while. Base case, m equals 1. Oh, I'm sorry, it's 2 and, oh, it's two and minus 1. So 2 and minus 1 double factorial. We get 2 times 1 minus 1 double factorial equals 1. Does this make sense if you have two people, there's one way to pair them off? All right, now let's go by induction. Induction. Assume true for, I'll write it as 2 and minus 2 people. We have 2m people. How many choices do we have for whom we pair the last person with? Not one. The last person. How many choices do we have as to whom they're paired with? We have 2m people. I want to see who should the, m the 2mth person be paired with. How many options do I have? 2m minus 1. So last person must be paired. There are 2m minus 1 options. How many people are left? So I have 2m minus 2 people left by induction. We have 2m minus 2 minus 1 double factorial, which is 2m minus 3 double factorial ways to pair these. And now we just multiply. So for a lot of these problems, there's many different ways of proving what the answer is. OK? All right. So this is the inductive proof that there's 2m minus 1 double factorial ways to pair 2m people into m pairs of 2. It turns out it's related to the moments of the Gaussian. A lot of the stuff we're looking at has really important applications. All right, so we have time to do at least one of the Rochester problems. We can either do the cubic problem, or we can do the sums of the reciprocals of positive integers. Any preference? I'm sorry, first loud voice wins. You've got to be fast. It's also, I, I, Personal preference, I would much rather do the sum of the reciprocals of the integers, but the cubic one fits better with all the stuff on the Gaussians. So I am glad that that one won. All right. 
So this is a strange property of a cubic. I have no idea who was looking at cubics and found this property, but cubic. So we have y equals x cubed. We have the point a, a cubed on it with tangent line going through b, b cubed with b not equal to a. And the claim is the ratio of slopes of tangent lines at a and b is independent of the point a. So let's draw what's going on. So here's the cubic. Here's some point a, a cubed. I draw the tangent. It's going to intersect at another point down here. So in terms of drawing the picture, it actually doesn't really matter how good of a picture you draw. It does turn out the point is below here. And so this will be the point b, b cubed. What's the slope of the tangent line at this point? I'm sorry? 3a squared. And here, so slope is 3b squared. Now, this is a cubic, this is a line. So if I take y equals x cubed and put in the equation of a line, I get a cubic in x. That should have three roots. I only see two roots. Where's the third root? Double root. A is a double root. So it turns out that this is a double root, this is the third one. For problems like this, it's really good to draw pictures. They tell us that the points of it on the curve are a and b. Well, let's give them good names. If we call the point a, a cubed, b, b cubed, that's a really good way to use the label of you know, the name. And then we have stuff talking about the tangent line. Let's write down the equation of the tangent line. It's y minus y1 is m x minus x1. So we get y minus a cubed is 3a squared x minus a. OK, what should we do next? How should we go about this? What's that? Find b in terms of a. Find b in terms of a. So we know that the point b, b cubed is on the cubic. And we know the point b, b cubed is on this line. So if I take y equals b cubed and x equals b, that's got to satisfy this. So what we get is we get b cubed minus a cubed is 3a squared b minus a. Anybody know how to factor b cubed minus a cubed? Right, this is where knowing certain identities is helpful. Yes. So um, b squared minus a squared is b minus a, b plus a. You know, this is the more standard one. You know, we're all familiar with this one, the difference of squares. More generally, if I give you b to the n minus a to the n, think about a as being fixed. As, v, as b varies, you know, I want to try to write this as a product of polynomials. I know that whenever b equals a, I have to get 0. So, the right, so if I want to factor this, it's got to be divisible by the polynomial b minus a. And then it turns out it's a telescoping series. It's b to the n minus 1 plus b to the n minus 2a plus, plus b a to the n minus 2 plus a to the n minus 1. And if you multiply everything out, if you multiply by b, this gives you a b to the n. This gives you a b to the n minus 1 times a. This gives you a negative a times b to the n minus 1. And so when you multiply it like that, you see all the intermediate terms cancel. 
and you're left with just b to the n minus a to the n. So it's a telescoping series. And we're using b minus a must divide. So again, we'll be doing logic riddles on Friday. After that, we need another topic. So if you guys want to talk about polynomials and roots and factorization, let me know. That's definitely another topic we can work into the course. You know, how do you see how things factor? I will not do polynomial long division. Nobody wants to do that. But there are a lot of times when you can just sniff out the relationship. And in the solution key I'll pass out for the homework that was due on Monday, there was a nice problem about integrating the cosine of pi x cubed versus the cosine of pi x squared. There's several ways to do this. One way is to use some trig identities. And so identities is a wonderful topic to know for stuff like this. The more identities you know, the more you can just look at things. All right, so going back to our problem, you know, this is now known. So now returning to what we need to do, we get b cubed minus a cubed is b minus a, b squared plus ab plus a squared. And this turns out to then has to be uh, 3 a squared times b minus a. OK. The b minus a's cancel. Why can't I just cancel the b minus a's? Because it can't be 0, because we're assuming b is not equal to a. We're assuming b is a different point. So because b does not equal a, we get b squared plus ab plus a squared has to be 3a squared. All right, so we get b squared uh, is 2a squared minus ab. And that's the key relation. We can now relate b squared to a squared. This term is going to cause us a little bit of difficulty, but not a huge amount. Oh, because I can now just cancel the b minus a's. Oh, okay, okay. Now, if b does equal a, is this still true? No. Well, but is b zero? Well, oh, that if b equals yeah. a, b squared plus b squared plus b squared is 3b squared. Yes. So actually, this always works. Even if b happens to be a, this is still going to be true. If b was a, would the top part be zero? Over here? Yes, but this line over here that we're going to use, this is still true even if b equals a. Mm -hmm. So we proved it under the assumption that b does not equal a. You might want to try to like, you know, cross your fingers, click your heels together three times, and say, by continuity as b approaches a, this should be true. The difficulty with this, of course, is that we're looking for the intersection on a cubic. We don't know where b is relative to a. We can't just move b around. It is where it is. So now the problem is we want to study the ratio of the slopes, 3b squared over 3a squared. Why am I putting a in the denominator? Why am I looking at the ratio this way and not the other way? I mean, to me, I've got b squared in terms of all the other stuff. I don't want to have a lot of junk in the denominator. I'd rather have junk in the numerator. Plus a is my fixed special point. I want to be comparing things to a, not comparing a to things. So again, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference, but just for me, psychologically, this is the way I would look at the ratio. So 3b squared over 3a squared, the 3's cancel. We get 2a squared over a squared minus ab over a, over a squared. And so we're left with b over a squared equals 2 minus b over a. Ah, it's almost what we want, right? We want to find the ratio of b over a. I'm sorry, we want to find 3b squared over 3a squared. We want to find b squared over a squared. We don't quite have that. We have b over a. But hey, we can solve this for b over a. And once we've solved it for b over a, we can square our answer. So let's let r for ratio equal b over a. We now get r squared equals 2 minus r. r squared 
plus r minus 2 equals 0. How do we solve this? Yeah, we could actually, we, we don't even have to use the quadratic formula. It's r plus 2, r minus 1 equals 0. So we get r equals negative 2 or 1. And so that means b, 3b squared over 3a squared is equal to either 4 or 1. So the problem was to show it was constant. We almost showed it was constant. Damn close. Is there any way we can correct this? Yes? Well, if b is not equal to a, then their ratio can't be 1. Good, why not? All right, so if you just said clearly, obviously, one can easily see that. You have to put in those words on an exam. All right. So why does the fact that, I mean, it is interesting. I, I love how you said if b does not equal a. Because what if b does equal a? What do you get? The ratio has to be one. The ratio has to be one. So it is interesting, um, the relationship we had there uh, we commented, we didn't know at first that this had to hold even when b equals a. It does hold, and whew, we have to get a 1 here. Life is good. Life is consistent. So it makes sense that we do have this floating around. This is a really strange problem. I love this problem. Not as much as the reciprocal of positive integers, but it's still a nice problem. Why can we claim that it has to be 4 and not 1 if b does not equal a? Well, here's the thing. If you look at the curve, you've got to somehow argue, let's assume without loss of generality that A is positive. If A is negative, we just flip things over. That the other intersection has to be down here. And so if the intersection is down here, B has to be negative. So then A over B has to be a negative number. So you have to make the argument that it can't be intersecting up over here. That's the difficultness. And so we're run out of time, so I will leave you know, finishing that up to you as a nice exercise. Yes? So you would have to prove that if it's tangent to the curve in one quarter, it intersects it in the other quarter? You would have to somehow prove that the other intersection has to be somewhere down here. And then that will prove us that it's 4. Or you would have to prove that the intersection is always up here. Yes? Oh, because we get that the only way it can be positive 1 is if they're equal. And then we would have to then eliminate that other point, which I think is not so bad to do. So I, I think you're on the right track, and I think that's the best way to force it to be down here, is that the only case we worry about is when b over a equals 1, which means b equals a. And we know that's not happening. Okay. All right, so this is a good place to stop.